In the aftermath of the COVID-19 global pandemic, a slew of companies have announced that they're going to make the full-time switch to being remote. Facebook, Square, Shopify, Quora, Slack, and many others. At the same time, a lot of pundits have warned that this pivot to remote work is a mistake, and they point to the previous promises and failures of remote work. Who's right? Hello, Northern Lands 2. I'm Matt Clancy, and this is The Case for Remote Work. To start, let's define remote work. In this talk, I mean work that's done physically distant from collaborating coworkers. Now, that could be work from your home, but also a co-working space, or even a satellite office, as long as you're not working with the other people there. The big point is that remote work severs the tie between the job you perform and where you live. People have been waiting for this trend to happen for a long time. One particularly famous book was 1997's The Death of Distance by Francis Cairncross of The Economist magazine. That title and the accompanying cover image seem to promise that with remote work, we'll all work from the beach soon. But that didn't happen. And in seeking to understand why there was this disappointment, I think we've accepted an argument that remote work doesn't work that's too strong. A lot of remote work skeptics focus on their experience of remote work or their imagined experience of it for other people. They point out the various ways in which remote work falls short of being co-located, so next, physically next to your other coworkers. It's harder to manage workers who don't have sort of simple performance metrics. It might be harder to sustain relationships and culture. It might be harder to get spontaneous encounters, serendipity, creativity. Now, basic economics, and I am an economist, says that less efficient ways of producing get outcompeted in the market. If remote work is less productive than co-location, then it's going to get outcompeted and disappear. And you can point to a number of high-profile backtracks from remote work that seem to support this view, most famously Yahoo under Marissa Meyer. But inefficiency isn't what you tend to find when you actually look at studies of remote work. Most studies that simply compare remote and co-located workers find remote workers are more productive than their co-located peers. But you have to be cautious with that kind of data because it's likely that the most productive workers are also the ones who are allowed to work remotely. So that's probably a correlation, not causation. Fortunately, there are a small number of experiments that we can turn to for better data. One of the best studies is by a team that includes the founder of a large Chinese travel booking company. This group was able to say, let's just figure this out with an experiment. They got 250 volunteers who are interested in remote work and work at this company, and they assigned half of them to work from home four days a week, and the other half, the control group, to stay in the office. And they had to stick with that arrangement for nine months, whether they wanted to switch or not. This study found the remote workers were 13% more productive and half as likely to quit as the co-located control group. And the company was so pleased with the results that it rolled out the policy to the whole company. Another study looks at U.S. patent examiners. The U.S. Patent and Trademark Office has a similar program where you can work from home several days a week. And like the previously mentioned study, examiners in the program seem to be more productive than those who are in the office full-time. But what's interesting is that in 2011, they created a new work from anywhere program that completely severed the link between the job and where you live. You no longer have to go into the office even one day a week. More people wanted into that program than there were spots, and so entry was rolled out in a basically random way. The study compared the productivity of examiners who got in to those who wanted in but had to wait for an opening. And they find the Work From Anywhere program increased productivity relative to the Work From Home group by another 4%. Now, if you're a remote work skeptic, this evidence might not move you very much. Travel booking, patent examining, these might be sort of jobs that are unusually suited to remote work, and the results won't generalize. And I agree. We need more studies of similar quality on more collaborative kinds of work. But we do have some studies, and what they are suggest remote work works there too. For example, Google has this really distributed workforce, but in an internal study of their own workers, they found no difference in performance or promotion for employers that have to collaborate remotely and those that don't. Or last month or last May, Stripe announced its fifth engineering hub would be 100% remote. A year later, their remote workers are performing great, 
and Stripe is expanding the program. Similarly, we can just look at the companies at the beginning of this talk that have decided to go full remote, and we assume that they probably had an idea about the performance of the remote workers during the COVID-19 forced migration to remote work, and they must have decided things were going okay. Looking beyond tech, turning back to studies, there's one study on the effect of remote work in Portugal for a broad range of companies that suggests more mixed results than what I've said so far. So this paper has data on about 400 firms that switched from not offering remote work to offering it, or vice versa, over the period 2011 to 2016. And on average, this study finds going remote is actually bad for worker productivity. Now, that's the kind of finding a remote work skeptic is not going to be surprised to hear. But it turns out that this average effect hides a lot of variation. For some firms, going remote is good. For others, it doesn't make any difference at all. And for others, going remote is bad. The firms that tend to experience a productivity decline after going remote are concentrated in what you might call lower performing firms. They're smaller, they employ lower skilled workers, they don't export, they don't do R&D. When you look at something like firms that do R&D only, they actually see a 9% increase in productivity when they enable remote work. So my point is when you look at actual studies of how remote work functions, it seems to me pretty undeniable that it's not inefficient relative to co-location, at least for some kinds of jobs and over the time frames studied. Now, there's a bit of a caveat in that last sentence. Over the time frame studied. A remote work skeptic might believe that Remote work is like this insidious poison. It seems innocuous or even good at first, but destroys the long-term health of a company. Remote work skeptics often argue it's harder to be innovative and creative remotely. And I think the critics do have a point here. Economists have a technical term for this phenomena, local knowledge spillovers. And the existence of local knowledge spillovers is one reason why innovative companies locate in expensive cities. They want to be close to other knowledge workers. By being physically close, you enable serendipitous encounters and the exchange of ideas. You help your workers build dense social networks with other experts in their field, and they can get advice from these people later. And if you need to have a face-to-face -face meeting with another expert, it's really easy to go just do that. And for all these reasons, economists have long believed R&D effort by one firm spills over and benefits nearby firms that work along similar lines. But while I'll concede local knowledge spillovers are real, I mean, I do think they exist, I want to argue that their importance has been shrinking as technology makes it easier to get knowledge from far away. So as an example, suppose you live in a medium-sized town and you have an inventive personality. There was a time when most of your opportunity for learning came from locally available resources, people in the local library, for example. In that era, local knowledge spillovers were really important. But now suppose a new rail or airline opens up and you can travel into the nearest big city more often. Now you can benefit a bit more from the knowledge in that larger city, even though you don't reside there. And this is the kind of thing economists find when they look at the impact of new low-cost airline routes between cities in the USA or new high-speed rail lines between Chinese cities. In both cases, studies find that academics in those cities collaborate more with people in the newly connected cities once they get the opportunity to do so. Now it's not as good as living there, but it's better than the situation before. And that's one example of how technology can weaken the importance of local knowledge spillovers. Or now suppose your town gets connected to the internet. Your physical proximity now matters even less. Another set of studies looks at the impact of the internet, of internet connectivity in the 1990s. They find when a firm has more than one location, for example, and those locations get connected uh, via the internet, Suddenly those two locations are more likely to collaborate on patents, they're going to cite each other's work, and so on. Now, as the internet develops from the 1990s era, it just gets better and better at connecting you to distant knowledge. You start to get repositories of information like JSTOR, Sci-Hub, Wikipedia. You start to get social networks that connect you to people with interesting ideas. For example, earlier this year, a paper came out about this interesting experiment using Twitter. The paper compared the citations received by a set of papers that were tweeted out by a major Twitter account and a control group that wasn't. I mean, the study controlled the account. And the tweeted papers got four times as many citations after one year, at least on average. Now, the paper came out in the Annals of Thoracic Surgery, which is a journal I don't read in a field I don't know anything about. And the nearest co-author was more than 500 miles away from me. How did I learn about this paper? On Twitter. 
All these forces, cheaper travel, better access to codified knowledge, and the internet make it less important for me to reside near other people to do cutting edge innovation. And that actually seems to be what the data show too. For example, there's a study that reads the text of all US patents and pulls out the most important sets of one to three words in each decade. These correspond to different technological concepts, they, things like polymerase chain reaction or microprocessor. And because they've read all the patents, the authors can see when these words first show up in a patent and use that to figure out the age of an idea. And then they look to see if inventors who reside in big cities use younger ideas at a higher rate than inventors who reside in small cities or medium towns. If local knowledge spillovers matter, you would think they, you know, big cities would use these ideas faster because they're going to learn about them faster from the other people there. And for most of U.S. history, that intuition is correct. They did. But the benefit has fallen. And by the 2000s, there's no difference at all between how quickly big cities and small cities use these new ideas. Another look study just looks at how common are these supposed serendipitous encounters. And they survey hundreds of Norwegian firms and ask them to name the most important business partner involved in the creation of an innovative process or product. Then they ask how these firms met their partner. About 20% of the time, it's from a chance or casual encounter. But when the authors look to see if these kinds of encounters are more common in big cities or small ones, they find no evidence of that. If anything, small cities have more of these kind of encounters. Now, one last piece of evidence is simply to look at the extent to which knowledge workers collaborate at a distance. Over 1975 to 1990, the average distance between inventors who are jointly listed on a patent was about 1,000 kilometers. In the last 30 years, though, that's crept steadily up to 1,800 kilometers. Or cut another way, the share of inventive partnerships on patents where the inventors are 100 kilometers away or 500 kilometers away has risen sharply. Alternatively, you can look at academic collaboration. The share of U.S. academic papers featuring international collaborations rose from about 20% to nearly 40% over 96 to 2018. And, you know, that surely understates the extent of uh, distant collaboration because you don't have to be an international team to have long-distance collaboration. So, you know, between patents and academic papers, it looks increasingly like long-distance collaboration is just the norm. Now, my claim is not that local knowledge spillovers are zero. It's just that they're declining in importance. And you can point to other studies that I didn't highlight in this talk that show that they still matter. And that is going to be reassuring to a remote work skeptic. If you're a remote work skeptic, maybe you're going to concede now after this talk that, well, okay, remote work functions better than I thought for some jobs and at least in the short term, and it maybe isn't as important to be physically close to people as I thought, but it's still more, it's still better to be co-located than not co-located, even if the effect is not that much different. However, a little bit is all it takes if the market is efficient. Even being a little bit worse than the alternative isn't going to cut it. But focusing on all these issues actually undersells the case for remote work. So far, I've just been arguing the hit to a worker's productivity when they go remote is small or maybe even that they're more productive remotely. But the proper comparison really isn't comparing the same person, remote or in person. The kinds of workers you get are themselves going to be different if you're a remote company. For one, you might get a cheaper workforce. And that's something a lot of people focus on, is the idea that remote work might be cheaper. In the U.S., a college-educated worker in the densest part of the country earned an average hourly wage of approximately $25 an hour, compared to about $15 an hour in the least dense part of the country. And it's been estimated that you know one quarter of the increased salary for college-educated workers is accounted for by the higher cost of living in cities. And besides paying people a bit less because they live in cheaper areas, there might be other savings as well. The Patent Office estimated that it saved $38 million in 2015 alone due to reduced office space needs for its remote workers. And that Chinese travel booking study estimated that it saved $1,250 uh, per worker per year on remote workers. And it also had less attrition, which saved money on recruiting and onboarding. But although those are real, remote work doesn't only have to be about cost savings. It can also be a way to attract and retain the best employees because remote work is a valuable amenity and because it lets you access a larger labor market. So that might mean you're able to keep people you would normally lose by letting them work from anywhere. 
When the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office initiated its Work From Anywhere program, it actually maintained the same salary for all its patent examiners, and workers migrated to lower cost of living areas or other places with amenities that they valued. Now, one of those amenities could be just as simple as living near friends and family or your partner. This is an important difference between work from home policies and work from anywhere policies, because there are actually some studies that find working from home can be socially isolating, and so it might be negative. But if workers have the opportunity to relocate, for example, by moving back to their hometown, maybe that will compensate for the decline in the ability to socialize in the office. I mean, who would you rather be physically close to anyway, your coworkers or your non-work friends and family? A set of studies on Danish workers tries to estimate the actual dollar value of living near home. They looked at the moving decisions of Danish workers who were forced to find new jobs after their place of business closed by comparing the typical salary of the place they eventually moved to the salary of the places that these guys rejected. The authors try to infer the dollar value workers put on proximity to friends and family. And it turns out this is really large, at least that's what they find. Doubling the distance to the hometown is associated with a salary that's about $10,000 higher, and that's compared to an average blue-collar salary of $32,000. So the option to work remotely is a valuable amenity, and it can be used to retain existing workers. But these same amenities can also be used to attract new workers, the kind you wouldn't normally be able to get. Not just because those workers like the option to work from anywhere, but also because you can hire from a much larger labor pool. A remote first company might end up having the same wage bill as a co-located one, but it might be able to assemble a much better team by tapping into a much bigger pool of candidates. And those advantages might more than offset any decline in productivity due to uh, remote work being inherently inferior. But to realize that advantage, firms and workers do have to be able to find each other. For example, suppose there's a firm looking for just my set of skills, but it's a thousand miles away. How do they find me? And how do I find them? Fortunately, there are three positive trends that suggest this is a lot easier than it was even a decade ago. First is just that a lot more firms and workers are now using the internet to find and advertise for jobs. In the year 2000, just 26% of people used the internet to look for jobs. By the year 2011, that was 76%. Since then, internet job search has become so common that search data is just used to represent the entire labor market trends when economists study labor market matching and hiring and stuff. Second, online labor markets are getting a lot more sophisticated. They provide better information about job candidates and they use algorithms to help workers and firms sort through the set of applicants and job postings. One particularly interesting platform is Upwork, which matches short-term freelance remote workers to different jobs. It could be anywhere in the world. A set of studies have looked at the platform and found you know, simple algorithms and vetted information can have a pretty big effect on facilitating hiring at a distance. Third, a lot of people still find jobs through their friends and relations. And that can bias our search towards locally available jobs if most of the people we know are people who live locally. But the internet also stretched our capacity to form and especially to maintain geographically distant relationships. For example, one study of a Spanish social network found that while people were more likely to be friends on this network when geographically close, once they become friends, the extent to which they communicated on the platform didn't vary with distance at all. And that reminds me of how I'm in these text chains with a group of six high school friends who now live in all the different corners of the United States. Would we have stayed so close in the past? I don't know. The internet also helps people form new relationships. A third place is a term for a place outside the work and home, like typically a pub or a coffee shop, where people meet to socialize. And it's long been argued that the internet creates digital third places, where people do sort of hang out. Twitter and online games are frequently cited as examples. The internet can also serve as just a complement to more traditional means of networking. For example, one study of the 2012 Le Web conference found attendees followed each other on Twitter at a much higher rate after the conference as compared to a control group, hopefully cementing relationships that were found, uh, you know, founded in this very transient setting. So now there are actually lots of ways I can find that perfect job that's a thousand miles away. I might find it while just browsing the internet, or an algorithm will help me find it, or the firm might find my own website and contact me, or maybe I'm friends with someone who works there on social media. And a lot of this wouldn't have worked very well until at least the last decade. So that 
In a nutshell, is my case for remote work. The traditional advantages of co-located work, higher productivity and innovation, those advantages are falling, and they may even be gone, at least for some kinds of positions. But the important point is, even if there are real advantages to co-location, remote work can still take off if those are offset by the advantages of remote work, which is the potential of getting more bang for your buck in terms of hiring. And the advantages of remote work are likely rising. I think it's easier to match workers and firms now, and the cost savings are becoming more and more salient. But that's just my opinion based on these studies. What are the people who run businesses actually doing? Prior to COVID-19, the prevalence of remote work in the United States steadily climbed from about 2% of people working from home full-time to 5% between 1980 and 2020. So that's 40 years. But that's an understatement of what is actually going on because working from home isn't the only way to work remotely. Once you factor in working from co-working spaces, satellite offices, and coffee shops, and so on, the true number is probably closer to 10% of people now working full-time from home. And that was before COVID hit. In the midst of the COVID-19 epidemic, the share of people working full-time from home shot up to about 50%. Now, I think obviously it's not going to stay there. But lots of companies have been forced to try remote work and have been pleasantly surprised. In a survey of hiring managers, 56% said remote work was going better than expected, and less than 10% said that it was going worse than expected. For managers, not workers, mind you, but managers, more thought remote work had increased productivity than thought had decreased it. And 62% of hiring managers thought that they would have basically more remote workforces going forward. My point is not that we're all going to go remote, everyone's going to live on the beach or in a cabin on the mountain. I think that's crazy. Cities are here to stay. But I do think we're not going to go back to just 10% of people working remotely. It's not for everyone. It's not for every job. But I think it does work more often than has been appreciated. And lastly, in my view, this transition, if managed well, has a lot of potential upside. It might reduce carbon emissions due to commuting. Maybe we'll end up accelerating national economic growth since it enables this population of people who are too big to fit in any one city to collaborate, innovate, and find each other as if they did, or at least something close to that. And lastly, I see remote work as one of the best possible solutions to the rise in geographic inequality. For the last several decades, economic growth has been increasingly concentrated in big cities, leaving behind rural economies and their inhabitants, like the U.S. state of Iowa, where I live and where I'm talking to you from now. Remote work offers a way to tether those left-behind regions to the cities, spreading economic activity more equitably. Thanks, everyone.